As a data scientist and social scientist, Ruman's passion lies at the intersection of artificial intelligence and humanity. She is currently the global lead for responsible AI on the applied intelligence team, creating a responsible and ethical AI products for Accenture clients. She holds two undergraduate degrees from MIT, a master's from Columbia University, and a PhD from the University of California, San Diego. She has been honored as one of BBC's 100 women, um, Silicon Valley's 40 Under 40, a TEDx speaker, and is a fellow at the Royal Society of the Arts. She is the founder of the Equals Academy, a skills training program that links Syrian refugees to the freelance economy, and the creator of Ally, an app to improve meeting dynamics. Ruman is an avid believer in social justice and using exponential technology to create equality. Thank you and welcome Ruman to the stage. Thank you very much. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Hi, I'm Ruman and I do artificial intelligence and ethics. And I have one question to start this talk, some audience participation. Who are your heroes? Just name them, shout them out at me. Sorry? Einstein. Einstein, okay. Good one, and who else? Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, great one. Mandela. Mandela, okay, I will take those four. And I will say that there's one common theme to our heroes. Our heroes are people who did something more than the world thought they would do. They stood up against something that was bad or wrong, or they accomplished something often in spite of who they were born as or what society deemed proper or appropriate for them. And that's what I'm here to talk about is a concept called algorithmic determinism. Now Samantha set up, inadvertently set up my talk perfectly. Algorithmic determinism is this concept of human beings being guided and shaped by the algorithms around us, and we don't even know it's happening. And this started, actually, it's been happening for quite some time. But today, it's getting even worse because of all the predictive algorithms that are all around us. This is a picture that might look familiar to some of you. This is an image of the filter bubble. It's the cover of the book, The Filter Bubble. Can somebody tell me, just give me an idea of how long you think we've been, oh, sorry, before I ask that question, to define the filter bubble. It defines the media that you are exposed to, the news that you see, even the types of headlines that you read, and everything that you think the world is shaped as, which is, by the way, algorithmically derived, right? So all of these names here, Google, Flipboard, Washington Post, Amazon, Netflix, they curate your world for you. And, they, they, and your opinion of what the world is is actually vastly different from the opinions of everybody else around you. And yes, that has always been the case. One person's reality is not another person's reality. However, that reality, as Samantha correctly pointed out, is being shaped by others. So how long do you think we've been living in this filter bubble? Five years, six years, eight? <laughs> in the technological filter bubble. So the book, The Filter Bubble, was actually published 10 years ago. So think about it, we're an over, so that's when the book was published, right? So this phenomenon has been going on for more than 10 years. So we have been slowly and slowly retreating into our own comfortable, curated world where we're coddled and we're told that we're right and we're told that everybody in the world agrees with us and we're told that people who disagree with you are wrong. And that's the world we live in today. And this is why I fear algorithmic determinism. Algorithmic determinism is an evolution of the filter bubble, because you see the filter bubble is what the media tells you the world is like. Algorithm determinism is when everybody else tell you, tells you what you are like. It tells you who you should be and what you should do, and it gives you these little soft nudges, and it tells you what's appropriate, not appropriate, not explicitly, but in such a way that you go willingly and smilingly into the future they've decided for you. Algorithm determinism as a data scientist, I define this as measurement bias plus a feedback loop. So let's take those two things apart for the non-data scientists and often the data scientists in the room. So measurement bias is what you think you are measuring is not what you are actually measuring. So for example, there's a lot of talk in the US today about predictive policing. That would be using an algorithm to determine where best to capture criminals. It's based on a measurement of crime. Now, there is significant measurement bias in a measurement of crime. Why? Because a measurement of crime isn't a measurement of actual crime. It is a measure of caught and reported crime. It is 
the number of people who have called and said, hey, my car got stolen, and it is the number of police officers who have pulled over somebody who was speeding or somebody who was robbing a bank. Now, we know that that is not bias-free. We know that there is a systematic error in that, and that is the measurement bias. So when we use that measurement of crime to make a prediction of crime, we're reinforcing that bias. So why is that dangerous? That plus a feedback loop. So a feedback loop is a structure that causes output to influence input. So let's put those two together. Let's say we have a measurement of crime. Now we know that, at least in the US, minorities are disproportionately tagged for crime. They are put into gang databases just for being brown or black, not actually gang affiliated. And then we create an algorithm to say, OK, we're going to determine where to send all of our police officers in a high crime area. So we use this bias data. We make this algorithm. We send the cops to the neighborhoods. And guess what the cops do? They catch criminals, not because the other neighborhoods don't have criminals, but because these are the neighborhoods that are the most discriminated against. And then that data co goes back into the algorithm, creating a feedback loop. And then you're just reinforcing your own bias. And that's what's really dangerous about algorithmic determinism. Now, what I worry about is a world in which we have things like this. This is the social credit score in China. It's the Wired magazine cover. So the social credit score, what that does is a measurement of how good you are. Literally, it is a measurement of your value as a human being. And this is different from the US credit scores. And of course, we can have a lot of discussion about the inequity of that. But this goes beyond that to say, this is going to control where you can take a train to, where you can live, who you're allowed to associate with. In other words, literally, how good of a human being you are. And by the way, it's not just based on things like criminal history. It's based on things like where you went to school and how high of a degree you have. So if you were able and privileged enough to go to good schools and get advanced degrees because you didn't have to work from when you were a teenager, oh, by the way, you are a person of more value. Here's another one. Amazon has patented wristbands to track what their workers are doing. So every movement they make gets tracked, and Amazon says it's in order to improve efficiencies. By the way, I can guarantee you Jeff Bezos is not wearing that wristband, right? That wristband goes to the factory workers, the people packing the boxes, the people packing the things for Amazon Prime distribution, who, by the way, have to work at a breakneck speed so people like myself and everybody in this room can get our packages in two days. But now they get to be constantly monitored and measured for the goodness of what they're doing. Palantir has been using predictive policing in secret in New Orleans. And again, as Samantha pointed out, we don't get consent for these things. And in fact, the, the um, city council hadn't even consented to this. They did this around the city council because they worked with the, with the, the police officers. Um, they were able to create predictive policing technologies and deploy them in New Orleans, which is, by the way, an area known for racial discrimination without even city council members knowing or anybody in New Orleans voting on it or approving it. And finally, something that came up rather recently, there's a company that's providing facial recognition to schools for free. So if they want to catch who the next shooter might be, and I, by the way, do not know how they will train this algorithm, but now they can constantly film everything every student is doing. And if they start to nod off, or if they are passing notes, or if they're joking around in the back, or maybe trying to sneak out and instead of going to the bathroom, going to the back to have a cigarette, something that probably everybody in this room has done at some point, right? They will be flagged, tagged, and monitored. And they will be watched, and they'll be pulled aside, and they will be lectured, and probably sent into some sort of special counseling where they get to be marked as different from the other children. So what I've listed are a lot of primary harms, right? So the primary harms would be loss of liberty, loss of opportunity, economic harm, or social detriment. So we are either directly harming people, and it's, it's very measurable, right? So if you target a kid and you pull them out of class and you know all the other kids are talking about them like the weird kid, we see how that might be this reinforcement. And by the way, things like stereotype threat are very, very real. When people are faced with a situation where they're going to be tested on something that they know that their kind of people are judged on, this would be, for example, women answering math problems, or black people taking exams where they're measured on literacy, you freeze up 
and you underperform because you're so worried you're being judged about the thing that everybody says you're supposed to be bad at. So let's think about this, this, school, this uh, school facial recognition situation. You take some student who probably doesn't really fit in very well, they're a little bit awkward and shy, and probably a lot of people have been that person. They maybe sit at lunch alone, or they only have one or two friends, or maybe they just prefer to read a book during lunch. Well, hey, they're not socializing. They're getting flagged. They're getting monitored. Then they maybe get pulled aside. Then the, all, the, all the other kids say, yeah, we knew that kid was a weirdo anyway, right? Social detriment. But also I'm going to talk about secondary harms. And this is where algorithm determinism starts to shape who we are and push us towards a homogenous average. So by the way, the way algorithms work, essentially, no matter how much you hyper-personalize an algorithm, it makes you a type. And yes, before, you know, if anybody here has worked in marketing, you would have six types of people. You call them a persona, right? Think about an algorithm as having 3,000 types, 200 types, but you are still a type. You are not a unique individual to an algorithm. What an algorithm will do is try to push you towards the average of that type. So you are supposed to be the norm of that type of person. So the secondary harm that comes here will be something like this. So Baidu and KFC worked to make a facial recognition ordering system at, you know, for, for their KFC store. So you walk up to it, it takes a picture of your face, and then it sort of tells you what it thinks you should order. And it's based on things like gender, it's based on things like age, and actually for women, it's based on how good looking you are. And here's a direct quote from the press release, and it says, a male customer in his early 20s would be offered a set meal of crispy chicken hamburger, roasted chicken wings, and a Coke, while a female customer in her 50s would get a recommendation of porridge and soybean milk for breakfast. Wow, <laughs> women have so much to look forward to. Thanks. So the fear of algorithm determinism here is something deeper than a facial recognition tagging you as problematic. Now it's saying women should be like, and men should be like. So the way this works, by the way, is it offers you that meal. You can say no to the meal, and then it'll offer you the menu. But it won't be just the menu up on the board. It's actually an algorithmically determined menu that is supposed to give you the order in which it assumes you will prefer things. And these are what, in Silicon Valley, people will call nudges. So in order to get, let's say you're a 50-year-old woman, and you know what? You want that sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit for breakfast. And the algorithm's like, well, 50-year-old women shouldn't be eating sausage, egg, and cheese breakfast. So you have to say no to the porridge. Okay, fine, I get this whole menu, and it's probably going to read in order yogurt, cereal, and all the healthy things you've got to scroll through, scroll through. But every one of those scrolls is a reminder to you that you are different, that you are aberrant, that you are wrong. And unless you've come in with a very strong intention of, I want that sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit, you will most likely go with one of the first few things they sent you. But if you were a man, you would have been offered that sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit up front. No, but it wouldn't be oddly telling you that you're wrong for wanting that. And so why does that matter? Right? That's, it's, it's kind of a silly example, but it's not, right? Because what we are pushing people towards, you know, food isn't just food. Food is gendered. Food has impact and meaning, right? Food holds meaning for many societies. When we think about it, in many societies, women suffer from body dysmorphia. Right? Women suffer from this, this desire and value of self-worth that's driven by wanting to be thin and pretty. And by the way, women shouldn't be messy eaters. Women should have dainty things like salads and yogurts and porridge and so And especially if you're an old woman, then you should definitely never be in the center of attention. You should just eat your porridge and soybean milk in the corner by yourself, right? And implicitly, and again, this is not designed scientifically, the measurement bias here is that your gender and your age and how good looking you are has nothing to do with the food you want. And yet here we are reinforcing negative social stereotypes by something that seems kind of fun. Well, it's, ultimately it's not fun. And this is why it's algorithmically determining who you should be and nudging you and shaping you to be a homogenized human being. So the question you ask then is, well, what can I do? And again, I thank Samantha for setting up that nice list of questions because <laughs> I have answers to some of them. Number one is to say, is it worth it? Whenever you share a piece of data about yourself, you're giving away a currency for free, right? As, again, Samantha pointed out so beautifully. Um, but you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? And I'll give you an example. A lot of people love 23andMe. It's a popular genealogy, um, that, uh, genealogy startup that you send your DNA to, and then they tell you, you know, you are 10% Irish, so whatever. Recently, when, oops, 
I forgot to put the question up. Um, recently, 23andMe, because by the way, when you did that, you gave them ownership and rights over your entire genetic makeup, which is actually quite an incredibly valuable thing to have. Recently, 23andMe partnered with GlaxoSmithKline to then allow that genetic information to be used for research. And by the way, they didn't have to ask anybody to do that because your genetic information is not automatically protected. When you gave it to the company, they put it in a nice database and they stored it for, an, for a use case exactly like this. So whenever you share data, however innocuous it may seem, because the Baidu example sounds funny, right? You're like, oh, whatever, it's a pic picture of my face. You know, What are they gonna do with that information? Well, first of all, they're nudging you to do a particular thing. And second, do you know they're hoarding that information? And they may not know what to do with it today, but they'll figure something out. The second thing is to fight the stereotype. You will notice, like, it's one of those things, once you see, you cannot unsee. You will notice how you get nudged to be just like everybody else of your type. You will notice that your ads seem to be very perfectly geared towards you. It's not geared towards you, by the way. It's geared towards the algorithm's view of who you should be. So be very, very conscious and make sure you fight your stereotype. Thank you very much.